Hi, welcome to the Winners Find a Way show and podcast with your host, Trent M. Clark, three-time World Series coach, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur, having started 12 companies, coach to the 1%, and an international speaker. This show is going to be your go-to podcast for facing adversity, being inspired, and overcoming obstacles, all from the best in the world, business, sports, and leadership. Hate the crappy ingredients in many beverages and energy drinks? Rebellious Infusions are the go-to functional beverage. They have five or fewer plant-based organic ingredients. No sugar, no calories, loaded with antioxidants to boost your immune system, and L-thionine for brain health. Rebellious Infusions are available at drinkrebellious.com. Rethink your drink. For 10% off of your next purchase, use the code 99999. Hello and welcome to the Winners Find a Way show. I am your host, Trent Clark. I'm with my good buddy, Christopher Salem. Chris, what's up, buddy? Hey, Trent. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, it's great to have you, man. We've been talking for a while and involved with a group together, and I'm just thrilled to have you, man. I mean, you've had a lot of impact around the world, Chris. Want to get into that in just a minute? I am your host, Trent Clark, CEO of Athletes International, our Athletes Influencer Marketing. CEO of Leadershipity, we do NIL Academy and NIL Education, and we train a lot of leaders, and I do a lot of growth coaching. So love the fact that I've got another fellow coach with me today, because that's a bunch of fun. Most people know me because I coached in three World Series. So when I have a fellow coach on and a fellow baseball lover, Chris, man, I am in seventh heaven, brother. So super excited, Chris. Danbury, Connecticut native. Tell quickly where they can find you, Chris. Best place to find me always is on LinkedIn at Christopher Salem. If I had to pick any social media, that would be the one I spend uh, the most time on. Or you can check out any of our websites at ChristopherSalem.com or SustainableSuccess.net, either one, or my email at chris at christophersalem.com. Love it. All right. As I said, Danbury, Connecticut native. And now you come right out of this thing coming out of high school hot and you're like, hey man, I am destined for one of the best college baseball programs in the country, Arizona State, and you're going to head there and go to school. I think Danbury hosts one of the major Little League championships. Isn't that correct? There was something back in the day. I don't know if it's been recent. I think a lot of that now has been, I don't know if it's down in Georgetown, Delaware now. I think it does a lot of those things because they have the facility down there to accommodate that. But yeah. Danbury was known for things back in my day. Not so much these days, but, but definitely was. And it was something that I enjoyed being part of and was also part of it coaching my son up until he turned 11 years old. That's awesome. I think the Danbury team actually won the Little League World Series one year. So. Probably at some point. I know it wasn't with me at, 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 during the time I was that when I was at that age group at that time, but definitely. And it's we got it. We got a minor league team here and and does well. Yeah, lot. that's great. So big baseball. I mean, a lot of people aren't thinking, hey, upper New York area, greater New York area. Everyone's always thinking the Northeast is great baseball. Obviously, a lot of pro baseball ball up that way. It only comes to make sense that the kids are going to follow what the pros are doing. There is a lot of good baseball. And then you head to the beautiful sunshine of Phoenix and say, hey, listen, man, I'm going to play some baseball at Arizona State. Man, back in that day, I was... So let me tell you a funny story, Chris. I was in seventh grade going through my goals and my teacher had asked, what are you going to be You know, when you're 30 years old? But one of the goals that I wrote down when I was in seventh grade was the first question was, what are you going to do right after high school? And I said, I'd be playing baseball at Arizona State University. And <laughs> man, I, because Barry Bonds is a great player there, they were always, yeah, there's a perennial powerhouse. And basically, if there was going to be a college world series, Arizona State was going to be a part of it. And so I kind of knew it, certainly wanted to be in the sunshine as a Michigan kid, but I could see myself playing in the sun every day. That's what I saw for myself. Unfortunately, <laughs> when I, I was a pretty good high school player, but Arizona State never called. I'll be honest, Chris. So, you know, like, I didn't have to worry about that option because they didn't call. So, Tell me about your experience and how that went. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I was coming from Danbury, which was not like some major metropolis area, but we were close to New York City, about an hour away. For me, I was always, I loved baseball. It was something I lived, I just lived, slept, breathed it every day. And one of the things for me was that while I was pretty solid in terms of muscularity, even when I was in high school, 
I didn't have so-called height on my side. I, I'm 5'9". At the time, baseball players were getting bigger. But I, I had a shot that I could have went to some other schools, but I decided ASU was a great place. It had a great uh, program. But even though I didn't know it at the time, but subconsciously, I probably knew that, hey, Chris, you're probably not going to go pro. You may not even make the team at ASU, but... but Something else drew me out there. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do it. And obviously it didn't work out, but nonetheless, it taught me a lot about myself and a lot of the things that I had prepared up until that time and the things that I today have taken and carried out in other areas that I truly blessed to have, have gone through that experience. Love it. All right. Let's, well, let's get into that because you're an author, master your inner critic, great book. Now, one of the things you get a degree from Arizona State, spend some time on the West Coast, and now have returned back to Danbury. So kind of cool. We want to tell that story full circle here. But what most people don't know about you, which is really kind of crazy, right? Because you have a pretty big social media influence, yeah. 26,000 people on LinkedIn. You're connected to a lot of folks, right? You're a pretty popular dude. And you're an introvert, man. There's just, hey, like I go I, do the forward facing thing. And then I want to be me, man. I want to, oh, I need some downtime. I do. I wouldn't say that I'm introverted where I have, where it's awkward, where I have trouble having conversations. with people. That's not the issue at all. I love talking talking with people. It's just that I can only do it in, in certain doses of time. I have to have time to myself. I'm not one of those people that has to constantly be around people. I actually enjoy time either with my family, my wife, or a lot of times just with me. Like yesterday, my wife was busy. So I went for a walk from by myself. And I love that downtime. Even when I'm speaking around the world, I'm traveling and speaking at an industry conference or an event, usually after I'm done, I go to my room or sometimes if I don't have to be with certain people because that's part of why I'm there, I go out to dinner by myself and I enjoy that downtime to kind of just re recharge my batteries because if just like with anything, if you're around people all the time, you're going to get depleted. And I'm very, I value my time and I value my energy. So I, even though I'm a people person, I do love that time being alone. Yeah. It's funny because you think, and I'm in this game too, right? So you're going to, I appreciate the fact that, man, when I'm on the road, people don't understand like, oh, you're in front of hundreds of people at a time. But if you don't know how to manage your time alone, I can get lonely out there. I'm, I have five kids. I mean, my house is busy, right? All the time. And I'm like, Man, like this is way downtime, man, because people don't understand. You travel alone, and yeah, I'm forward-facing, and I'm with people for three, four, six hours, but that might be very distinct for those six hours over a two-day period of travel by myself, no one to talk to, being in the hotel, and you're like, man, if you don't have that, and this is, I think this is part of that inner critic. If you've got a tough inner critic around you, meaning me, right? Then that can get not only lonely, but troublesome. Yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, but yeah. let's come back to the winners find a way. Winners when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. I love to surround myself with people like this, Chris, who just get out there and find a way to win. And man, I love that quote from the four disciplines of execution book. And when I think about you now, I'm picturing my you as a Pretty young man, 18 years old. You're out across the country. No parents that got to help out. And man, you don't make the team. I got to pivot here. I, I got to figure this out. Oh, let alone, I, I lost my place to stay. I had to go join a fraternity. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So what do you do? That's a pretty challenging moment. At, did you think, hey, man, throw everything back in your bag and get in the car and go back? There was a point where I felt that, but there was just something that like what lured me out there. Because even though I couldn't consciously put my thumb on it at the time, that something said that you're meant to go out there. It's not what for what you think. It's not going to be baseball. You're not going to be playing baseball for ASU. I ended up playing in other leagues, of course, but it was something that I was meant to go out there. I joined a fraternity. I got involved in other types of things with intramural sports and out there. And that really it, it taught me a lot of things about myself and self-leadership and leading by example. And those are the things that I attribute today that have allowed me to develop myself into a leader 
in all aspects of my life and what I do today as a, a coach, a business executive coach and acceleration strategist in the areas of leadership. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's that moment where you start, to, you get into these situations. One of the things that you talked about a couple of times is, and maybe a little bit offline too, is, hey, these moments change and it's time to take a hard assessment, right? Of Where are we at? What, what are my liabilities? What are my strengths? What do I really want? Because like you said, there's a lot bigger things out there than just, hey, a team, one team. How many teams are there? There are hundreds of teams, right? You can, teams. you can find another team. So walk us through a little bit of that hard assessment and what you're asking, not only yourself, but probably what you ask some of your clients to do sometimes too. Is that fair? Absolutely. So one of the things that I always find that you're never going to be everything for everyone. So it's not trying to fit in. It's trying to be really true to who you are. What is your personality? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And that was a hard thing for me to really hone in on because I was always looking for ways to improve what, what I wasn't good at. And then it, and, it, and I had to learn the hard way, but that I did learn that I'm never going to be good at everything. And even if I practice, I'm still never going to be good at everything. But if I can focus on what I'm really good at, now I can leverage that with other people where I can offset their weaknesses for what I'm good at. They can offset mine for what I'm not good at. And that is a recipe for a winning team. And so I've been a big proponent of that, really getting to know thyself, creating a, an, a psychologically safe environment, helping people to do the same, really understanding your role and duties in that with your team and vice versa with everybody else. And how can we now elevate our level of communication where it's assertive, not passive or aggressive, where we can be as specific, clear and concise as possible. So there is very little to no room for assumption and speculation. When that communication is really elevated and we understand our role and our duties, we can learn to complement one another to win versus depend upon each other to, to win. And I always find that even if you don't win the game or, you know, you always learn and it's those teams that learn from what didn't work that they know they can make adapt and make changes that the next time they step up, they're going to win that next game. So those are the things that I learned and what I bring each and every day to my client base when I'm coaching them, whether it's an organization or an individual. I love it. Two big things I think in there that really hit home to me is that the pro athletes really get the fact like I can do this better than you. I, I have this skill and I can do it better than most people in the world. And I'm going to keep doing it until you stop. Not, oh man, I don't do this one thing really good. So I'm going to go spend the next seven hours in the cages learning how to bunt because I hit 60 home runs last year and I don't bunt very well. <laughs> never going to ask you to butt. <laughs> like, stop practicing. It's a waste of seven hours. And it's being wise to that. And there's other team members that are great bunners that we need and Absolutely. do that. Right? You never know where you got to step up to do that. That it, Sometimes the, the, the teams that I feel that stick to the basics, like even the late, great Kobe Bryant. I know it's another sport, basketball. Yeah. But you look at why he was one of the top basketball players to ever play the game was because he never got away from the basics. He would be out on the court at three o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles, shooting baskets around the perimeter, doing layups, doing free throws, things that you learn when you're in third grade, when you start the game. He never got away from that, where some other yeah. players felt they were too good for that. Well, I hit 60 home runs. I don't have to bunt. Why do I yeah. have to bunt? It's making sure that you never know. It's the people that know when to step up and have to do something that they normally don't do, but they're capable of doing and are prepared, those are the ones. And, and it's never getting away from the basics or the foundation. I'm a big foundational guy yeah. and I'm very disciplined and consistent with it and believe in it wholeheartedly. That's what builds a sustainable winning team long-term when they dedicate and commit to their foundation. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I talked to another former athlete that was on the show and he freaked out because he hates the don't sweat the small stuff story. He's like, it's oh, awesome. I, 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 I still love that. that little crap. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us have it. And there's a real point there, right? Like we're spending a lot of reps on some things that may not matter. But in the same breath, you as a manager, man, the little things matter, right? And one of the things that, let's talk about this from the athletic world, skill sets that we learn to the real world. I want to pivot to that a little bit because one of the things that I find we were so good at in sports, right? We're so good at failing, adjusting, watching the tapes. We're really good at reviewing the tapes because the tapes don't lie, right? The video doesn't lie. Oh, oh man, 
I was right there, coach. I really had a great leadoff and a great jump. And then you look on the video going, eh, it's not really a great jump. And my leadoff is about four feet short. And you're like, yeah, maybe not great, but and so it doesn't lie. And I think that's the one thing I've seen in my corporate work, organizational work outside of sports is that a lot of organizations do not review the tapes. They don't seem to want to jump into the losses and go, hey, we just applied on five RFPs and have got any. Should we be looking at what happened? No, we got three more coming up and we just got to put our head down and get them done. I'm like, oh, well, we lost on the last five. Maybe we should learn what we didn't get right. Exactly. What it's, do you, you see? Gotta, you got to get to the root cause of what's not working and where can we adapt to what is, not what we think it should be. It's a mindset shift that I think a lot of times that's the foundation that a lot of organizations don't want to address. They don't, they think it's, they don't feel it's important. So they're constantly reacting and managing the problem and not getting to the root cause of what's causing it to get, make it better and adapt to then turn it full, turn it around to where it's working in their favor. It's just a, just a lack of commitment to that process. Do you think you and I have a different set of maybe different mindset on this? Because I know people get, especially now, People freak out that a lot of baseball players are unsuccessful three out of four times. That's, and, and by the way, you still make $6 million a year now to do that level, yeah, right? exactly. But I mean, I can't even fathom, and you can appreciate that, a top major leaguer walking in after a pitcher strikes out the side in the first inning and the three people go, man. He's really good. I think I'm done here. I'm not going back up. No, we have nine innings. You're going to get three more chances. Yeah, right? exactly. like, and, and we have this set that like in the organization corporate world, it's man, there was a failure. We shouldn't try again. Like we we went out that one time and we tried it and it didn't work. And like, yeah, it didn't work. What do you got to do different? doesn't mean it's not going to work the next time. It doesn't mean that it's the failure is final. What do you see in that? Do you think we have a different mindset because of the baseball thing? No, I agree. I think it, like I said, anytime there's challenges and obstacles, and even in the case what you're talking about in baseball, it's a slump. If we don't experience the slump and then experience, we're never going to know what we can, where we can adapt and change. If everything were going and you didn't strike out and you got on base every time, there eventually something's going to happen. You're going to become complacent. You're going to become bored. And then you're going to create a problem anyway. So I find that the greatest advancements in any situation, whether it's business, baseball, or anything, it comes from what we learn when we go through those challenges and obstacles. They're blessings. They're opportunities to find out what can we do better to improve. And it's not about being the best. It's about being your best. It's those teams that adopt that philosophy that end up sustainably winning long term versus ones where everyone's got to show up to be the best. I look at when I went through slumps in life and in baseball, even though I, at the time I didn't see it that way because I was young and I would get down on myself. But now looking back, those were opportunities to grow and get better. And now I thank the, for those experiences because if I didn't have those experiences, I wouldn't be able to now take the good from it and now be the example of that and be a resource for others to help them do the same. Yeah, and you and I get this hyper learning level that most people probably don't. You and I sit in front of a lot of challenges and we get to guide and walk people through these things about how they're going to overcome, how they're going to adapt, what should they do differently, what are possible options, right? Let's do a SWOT analysis, all these things. And man, there's just tons of learning that come out of each situation. And the lessons are everywhere, right? I mean, they're just everywhere. And the other thing that probably you and I have a very thick skin to is that, hey, failure is never final. Like I've seen all sorts of failures. Like people recover, you'll be all right. I'm not. I don't get freaked out by failure. In fact, I kind of love it because like you said, the obstacles are the blessing. We're going to get way better out of this. It's not great right now, but if we all just sit out and at the annual meeting in six months, we're all going to be different and better because of the situation today. So I'm super excited. And they're like, oh, the sky is falling. <laughs> like, oh man, this is great. Like This is awesome. And I'm all pumped up standing on the table and they're like, ah, oh, this is terrible. No, I agree. It's the process. It's trusting the process. And I learned to, to, to say to myself every day, I can only control five things each and every day. And that's the communication to myself and other people being an assertive rather than a passive aggressive, my behavior, making sure that's in alignment with my communication, 
my attitude, it's happening for me, not to me, my emotions and how I respond versus react, where I can choose to respond from a, a, a secondary emotion, not the primary emotion, and then my level of action. That's it. And I can't control those same five things in other people amongst other things that are beyond my control. So I have to always remind myself and, and be the example to help people operate from your intentions, focus on those five things. And when you can come together as a team doing those same things in your role and duties, that's what how you're going to complement each other to win more games or win more better outcomes. And it doesn't mean you're going to win them all, but, but you're not going to react to the ones you don't win. You're going to learn and adapt and get better to win the next time. So that's for me it's what this my experience playing baseball at a young age up until college, what it taught me and everything that I learned. And some things I had to learn the hard way, but I can I'm very blessed and thankful for what I'm able to carry on into the real world in every role and duties that I have as a man, as a husband, father, a member of my community, and in the business world. Yeah, you hit on some big itties there, man, like adaptability, community, productivity, all these things that we're looking for. And tell me why people call you, Chris. I mean, did you become famous guy because the master your inner critic book? Did, is that what kind of set you into the next level? People said, man, I have to hear more from Chris or I need Chris's help. I love these five. I mean, they're yeah. fabulous. What I would say that book, you know, the book had a part in it, no doubt about it, but I would say it was the consistency in this case, Trent, that I was constantly being transparent and vulnerable, but in a healthy way, not establishing healthy boundaries, not airing my dirty laundry, but putting myself out there on social media, putting myself out there when I speak on stages around the world, on podcasts, on in blogs and articles. So it was the consistency of that content and constantly being out there in front of people, that's what led to more connections and more building my sphere of influence, leading to more opportunities and helping more people, helping them to generate the results they seek and then getting referrals and references. And that's kind of like how that process unfolded. So it, it was a series of things, that, but I would say it was the consistency of being operating from my values of transparency, honesty, and integrity that allowed me to be out there and then help as many people as I can to help themselves. And that includes businesses. Let's let's talk about the finish here. I know we got a little short time together. I wish we had some well, we more. Got, we got a few minutes. I was able to buy some time, so we're good. Okay, good. Okay. So one of the things that I want to dive in a little bit more to intentions from expectations. So something big in the master your inner critic, as well as self-limiting beliefs. I mean, we are often, like you said, we're our toughest critic, man. I yeah. mean, this is, and that inner critic is a loud voice sometimes, right? And it's the one voice you're trying to get rid of going, hey, listen, I can get out of my house if my wife's voice really is on me. But, hey, man, I can't get out of this head. <laughs> yeah. And from the athletic standpoint, where you are constantly got a coach's voice in your ear and you're translating that with your inner critic, man, that voice becomes really heavy in the athletic world because we learn really young that it's alive and well. It so walk true, me right? through people that, how do how are we doing good with this? Where are we challenged with this? What should we be looking for? So I could tell you right now, self-limiting beliefs are powerful and they're forged during our child development years with around five, six, seven years old. And these are the things that you pick up, you know, growing up and what you observe in your parents' communication, their behavior, their attitude, their emotions, in their actions. And these things can play out in a positive or negative way. Now, if they're playing out negative, they can have a huge impact on your confidence level. It doesn't mean confidence overall. You could be really confident in one area of your life. Maybe that was sports, but not have the same level of confidence somewhere else. And that's why you're having problems there. It can impact your decision-making, your communications, and being specific, clear, and concise to yourself and others, your risk-taking ability, your ability to be to take massive action. Many people are busy but not productive, so we don't realize how powerful self-limiting beliefs are. But at the same token, they can also be blessings if you're knowing how to now use them to now let them go to get to the root cause of them, and through a, through a daily routine which I don't know if we'll have time to go through it all, how to release them. And then it's almost like you're rewiring your brain to think in a different way. And those are the things that I did because I had 
my self-limiting beliefs growing up, the biggest one was the need for validation from others because I didn't get it growing up from my father. My father wasn't there for my ball games. He wasn't there to tell me, son, I'm really proud of you. And as a boy, every boy longs for that from their father. And when you didn't get that, what do you do? You seek it out in other people. And then I wondered why I became a passive aggressive in terms of my communication, because I also had the side of perfection, which I got from my mother. It was never good enough, or if you didn't do it good enough, she would do it for you. So I was enabled up into the point I went to college. I was a codependent by that time, a heavily codependent. Mm. I had to reprogram. I had to release all of that to reprogram myself to think in a different way, to learn how to become more interdependent. And those are, in my opinion, Trent, are the true leaders that have overcome those obstacles through self-awareness and reflection and now decide to get to eliminate the limiting beliefs, adopt a different way to think from intentions rather than expectations, to operate in the moment, not from fear, and now be a, a consistent example and a resource to help others do that for themselves. Those are the people I admire the most that step up to be that example and be that resource each and every day. Yeah, I think it's a great visual of, we do need reprogramming, right? I mean, just Commodore 64, I'm sure there's some great software written for that program, but we're running now on Microsoft Windows 11, right? It's a new day and that software, while great back then, isn't going to function very well in today's environment, especially when we get bad software in and we kind of build that up along the way. Let's go into that daily routine and, hey, there's some change that needs to be made. And it's going to be made by the daily habits. Is that fair? Yep. So let's get into that. How would you tell someone, work with them on that level? Hey, we're going to have to make some change and let's get into that. The thing is that telling somebody what to do, how, when, or why to do it is never going to be the answer long term. There's a time to be directive, of course. It depends on the situation and what kind of what kind of business it is. If you're a fireman and you're a chief of fire department, and there's a, bur- a fire behind that door. Okay, you're going to tell people you don't go open that door because you're going to get killed. That type of thing. That, But it's learning how to share versus tell. Learning how to ask questions to put people on the offense and to disguise you know, what you're trying to get across to them to, to create impact in those questions, allowing them now to decide what that means to him or her. I find that when you're able to put people on the offense, they're more likely to have those aha moments that now – see things for not for what they think it should be, but for what is and knowing what is best that they can do for themselves and for the team doesn't always mean they have to agree upon it, but knowing that they're going to do what's best for team. So it's how we communicate and use the share versus tell approach and empowering people to be part of that, to make their decisions and to buy in. And if they don't buy in, they don't buy in. And then, okay, maybe they're not a good, they're not going to be on the team. They're going to move on and go somewhere else. That happens all the time. And so with that being said, I find that when you create that psychologically safe space and environment and elevate that level of communication to to listen, to relate and understand before responding, putting people on the offense rather than the defense, you're more likely to get more people on board and doing what they got to do to to carry their weight to make it work. Yeah, I think that's critical. I mean, as you talk about that, we've often said, I can't want it for you. (laughs) So finding out where their offense lies, as opposed to say, hey, this is the offense we're going to run, whether you think it's good or not, man, that's had a lot of troubles along the way, for sure. So I love that. Let's uh, finish with a little bit of the athletic skills. You learned a bunch of things along the way, learning as a kid. How do you both use those in your world now as a coach But also, where do you think those skills really transfer in real world career day skills? I mean, here's the thing. Again, I was not considered tall for baseball. Even going into high school, there was even though there were kids my size, of course, but there were other kids that were getting a lot bigger than me size wise. So I had to adapt to my physical limitations. In this case, I played third base. And a third base is a hard position. People don't realize you get a lot of line drives your way and in balls that are hard to catch both on the ground or in the air. And you have to condition yourself to to sacrifice your body to stop the ball. And one of the things I learned at a young age was to be disciplined, that I had to learn not to be afraid of the ball, not to be afraid if I made an error, just step back up and figure out what could I do better now so that ball didn't get by me the next time. So I took a lot of shots to the chest in my face and shoulders, arms, bruises, you name it. But it was through the discipline and being consistent with that, that I took that 
into my, the next phase of my life in when I worked for others, when I w- started my own business and operated other businesses, now being what I do now as an executive coach, a leadership coach and business acceleration, I've applied those principles of discipline and consistency through my daily routine to develop myself personally, committing to things to develop myself professionally. And that consistency is what really connects with other people because people trust others that they see that you're doing things that are serving you to then serve others. And that I look back and if I didn't have that experience with growing up and having up my high school coach hitting line drives on a basketball gym floor during the winter, mm-hmm. during the off season, may have not been utilizing these, these skills that I have today to help business leaders rise above challenges and obstacles to see them as opportunities. I might have, maybe not would have been in doing what I'm doing. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't know if everyone understands the second hop on a gym floor is a little different than the grass. Yeah, right? but it's a lot different. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a little a lot gonna, Yeah, cup check is what I think right there about that second hop on a gym yeah. floor, right? It's, yeah, great memories, man. You bring it yeah. back, Chris. I really appreciate that, man. So good to have you on today. Chris, tell them again where they can find you. So the best place to find me, two websites, ChristopherSalem.com. That's more for my keynote speaking as well as for business leadership and leadership training. There's also SustainableSuccess.net. That is for when we help businesses in terms of increasing revenue net profit margin and scaling their businesses. You can find more information there. Or simply chris at christophersalem.com. That's my email. I'd love to connect. I love to help people and you know get to know who you are and vice versa. Yeah, for me, great show on the Winners Find a Way show. Thank you to Chris. Go out and grab his book, Master Your Inner Critic. I love it. And then just to recap, I mean, challenges are out there. When they hit hard assessment, very important. Taking that in. Understanding your self-limiting beliefs, so important that, hey, this inner critic is here and knowing that. Getting back to your intentions from your expectations, so important. And then, of course, those five really key elements that we get to control every day. Certainly, how we're doing on communicating to ourselves, how we're and others, and then behaving self and others, right? The attitude, so important. Emotionals, and then our level of action. Like what we get to control is so important. And man, you just model that consistently so well. And then, of course, obstacles are the blessing, never to be forgotten that it does feel hard going through these things, but there are reasons. There are places this is put in motion. And sometimes we just need to get that lesson. And I think it's such a blessing. And I don't know how many people have looked back on that in hindsight going, man, I'm so glad that happened. I can appreciate I can look back at all those trials and tribulations, and I'm very grateful uh, for each and every one of them and what you be to become and do that leads to different and better results long-term. Yeah, so good. So for everybody, thank you for joining us on the Winners Find A Way show. Thank you to Chris. We are on every Friday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. I leadership at a YouTube channel, LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live. Do look for us there. Podcast goes global every Friday with a show you can find on your favorite network, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, all of them. Check us out. And until next time, we will see you then. Rebellious Infusions are organic flavored water enhancers. Rebellious provides clean, focused energy in liquid packets. Just tear the corner of the packet and pour 16 ounces of water. Rebellious Infusions have no sugar, no calories, and up to 300 milligrams of antioxidants and loads of L-thionine for brain health. Rethink your drink at drinkrebellious.com. For 10% off your next purchase, use the code 99999. Do you want to be our next guest? Or do you have inspiring stories to share? Or do you love to inspire, support, and empower thought leaders? Feel free to send Trent a direct message on Instagram or Facebook at Leadershipity.